All right, so we're um, welcome to the Backyard Fruit webinar series. We uh, are still allowing everyone to enter in, so that number is climbing and climbing. So before we get started, we're just going to wait just a moment longer to make sure we get everyone who plans to be here um, logged in. And I do see that we have a, a question in the Q&A already. Um, so we do have some panelists who are going to assist us manage that chat box. So um, please go ahead and direct those questions to the Q&A and we'll handle those as they come in. So again, welcome to the first session of the Backyard Fruit webinar series. Um, you're now tuning into the first session, which is on blackberries. Um, my name is Ashley Hoppers. I'm the program coordinator for this series and also your presenter today. So um, before we dive into the actual presentation content, I'm going to give you just an overview about the vision of this program, the partners involved, how the session is going to be ran today, and I'll tell you just a little bit about myself. So um, again, thank you for being here. This started out as an idea for a way to connect people to their, their backyard landscapes. You know, right now with COVID-19 um, being entrenched in our communities, people are looking at their backyards more than, effort, more than ever as a venue for food production. Um, lots of folks are starting out vegetable gardens and that's great. And it's also making people consider adding fruit to their landscapes. Um, anyone who's grown backyard fruit might realize that that's pretty challenging and most of our fruit crops are not going to be something that you can set and forget. They're perennial crops and so it takes a good bit of effort to maintain these and for them to be successful and, and give you fruit. So UGA Extension in partnership with um, Auburn University faculty, uh, LSU Extension, University of Tennessee Extension and NC State Extension, we all decided to get together, create this series in hopes that it would connect their um, backyard gardeners to their landscape and give you some tips for success. So um, just a little bit about myself before we dive in. Um, I'm an Alabama native. I grew up in a small town, Montevallo, right south of Birmingham. I have my horticulture degrees from Auburn in fruit production. I've worked in the private sector some, and since 2017, I've been a UGA County Extension agent. And uh, I'm currently the agriculture and natural resources agent in Gilmer and Fanning counties in North Georgia. Now, um, we have quite a few people joining us today, and we know there's gonna be questions throughout my presentation. So, um, the way we're going to handle that is we have several panelists who are also horticulturalists from UGA. We have Ashley Brantley. She's the Muskogee County Agriculture Agent. We have Josh Fuder, the Cherokee County Agriculture and Natural Resources Agent. And then we have Amanda Tidro, our Northeast District um, Program Development Coordinator. So they're going to be fielding that Q&A box. So if you have questions, send those in as you have them. They'll be addressing those and then there will be an opportunity at the end of my presentation to ask some more questions if there are any. So um, to uh, not delay any further, I am going to share my screen and we'll get started with the actual presentation. All right, and if someone could let me know if you can see this screen, that would be super. Yes. Thank you. All right, so again, this is the first series um, in the Backyard Fruit Lunch and Learn series. And let's talk blackberries. So why grow blackberries? Um, or any backyard fruit really. Um, personally, for me, I think blackberries taste great. The health benefits are phenomenal and well-documented. Um, some people like having fruit in their landscape because it looks really pretty. And some folks are into the new edible landscaping trend that's going on and just want to add that extra layer of interest to their home garden. Um, Another reason to choose blackberries is that they're a native crop. They're well adapted and resilient to most of the Southeast. 
And in comparison to other fruit crops, and you'll see this trend for those who are attending the other sessions in the series, they're fairly low maintenance. Um, and then on top of all of that, they are prolific fruit producers. They really live fast and die hard in the season. And so a lot of people find that an attractive quality in a fruit. Now, what limits production? So you see, I have a fairly long list here. So we all know that growing crops of any kind come with risks. So some things we can't control like weather. Um, we're in the middle or coming out of a blackberry winter right now. So we had a late freeze. Um, so weather can be our friend or foe. Um, soil pH, fertility issues can certainly limit our success, pest and disease, birds and small mammals, um, the sheer perishability of the crop. Blackberries need to be harvested daily or every other day. So that one week long vacation during the summer um, harvest for blackberries um, will certainly hurt you there. Um, human error just not knowing um, when to prune or how to fertilize, things like that can certainly play into um, our level of success. And then um, lastly, I have um, poor site selection listed. And I really wanna emphasize that because I can go ahead and tell you, I can't even begin to count how many plantings I know will fail just from seeing where those fruit trees were planted. So um, just some tips for you here. So uh, those of you that um, have more hilly topography, this is something that you need to consider. And it's a big problem up here in North Georgia in the mountain area where I am. So you can see in this diagram, we have the hill and then we have the um, depressed area in the center. So as for all fruit crops, you know, we want full sun. I would say a minimum of eight hours for ideal production. Um, the sun is our friend because this is the lifeblood for photosynthesis, the creation of sugars, and therefore energy to create that fruit crop. So um, if you don't have full sun, you're going to have um, drastically decreased yields. So that's something that you need to consider right off the bat when you're looking in your backyard is, do I have enough sunlight for this crop to be successful and actually set fruit? We also want to avoid frost pockets. So again, I'm looking at that depressed area. We know that cold air is heavier than hot air, so it will rest on um, closest to the ground and roll down that slope and gather in that low pocket there. So we don't want to plant our crops, even if there's full sun down in that um, depression, because we know cold air will gather there and possibly injure that fruit crop. So. Um, we also want to have uh, soils that drain well and uh, ideally not have areas exposed to um, very strong prevailing winds. So another way of looking at the site here is just to, you know, further describe um, that cold air is going to roll down that hill. And so we want to, if we do have a slopey, hilly topography in our landscape, we want to plant to where that cold air is going to move through our planting and gather down in that recession and not have our plants down there because again that's where all the cold air is going um, and displacing that warm air that's radiating, radiating off the earth. So plant on the slope if um, this is this describes your backyard. For those who have a nice flat planting area in full sun, um, that's great. <laughs> um, I mentioned that blackberries are um, fairly resilient and adaptive to um, certain soil types. Um, clay, silty loam, um, sandy soils, you can make it all work. It just kind of depends on your personal situation. pH is something that isn't quite as flexible. So that's the measure of soil acidity for those who aren't familiar. And blackberries can tolerate um, a range between 5.5 and 6.5, but I would ideally like to see that soil sample come out around 6 to 6.5, um, just because if you're in an area where you would need to apply lime, if you start out at that 5.5 um, level, you have nowhere to bit going down. And so we, I would encourage you if that soil report came out right at 5.5, you would want to add a little bit of lime to give you that cushion. Again, soil drainage is absolutely essential with blackberries. Um, the saying goes is blackberries don't like wet feet. So if you're 
if your planting site holds water for a prolonged period of time, say after a very strong rain, it's been 24 hours and that area still hasn't drained, that's not a suitable site for blackberries. And if pH sounds unfamiliar and you're not sure about a soil test, um, contact your local extension office and ask them how you can do that because that soil report is extremely important in letting us know if your site is suitable for crop production from a nutritional standpoint. So this is what a UGA soil report would look like. Um, now every uh, state, because I know we have visitors from all over the southeast with us today, every state has an extension service. So there will be that local contact wherever you are who can assist you with doing a soil test. So it might take a little legwork on your part on figuring out who that person is, but they're there and they're happy to help you. But regarding the UGA soil report, this is what it would look like. And you would just take that soil sample, it would be ran for blackberries, and um, this is kind of what you would see here. So um, the most important thing um, I would argue would be that pH level. So you can see over here on the right side, um, the pH is at 6.7 and lime is not needed. So I would not need to go in and incorporate lime to raise that pH up to a suitable range. Um, looking over to the left, we have that uh, column showing phosphorus, potassium, and other essential nutrients for plant growth. You can see that the potassium is a little bit low, so that soil report would have a um, specific recommendation on how much potassium I would need to add to bring that nutrient level up to where it would be suitable for production. So this is a very, very valuable um, tool in your toolkit for planting that uh, fruit orchard because again, this is a perennial crop. You want to have the conditions right from the beginning because retroactively changing these things is kind of difficult. Um, so a little bit more about site selection and planting. This is very important. Ideally, you would be preparing your site six months to even a year prior to planting. Um, now, not everyone waits that long and that's okay, but again, making sure you do that soil test can really let you know if you need to step back and do some amending to your soil or not. Now, regarding a planting site, you might not have this much space, but I do think the pictures show the level of involvement that's really needed to create a suitable growing space for these plants. So, um, of course, you're going to need to remove all of the weeds and any perennial grasses or sod that, that would be competing with that plant for water and nutrients. You'll also, again, you'll want to take that soil sample and work the soil till it, you know, at least ideally if you can till it, you know, 12 inches deep working that soil, that, that is beneficial to break it up so it's a more um, suitable growing area for those new roots. Um, and if any changes do need to be made, you'll refer to that soil test um, for what to do. And if you have any questions on how to interpret it, again, you have a local county extension contact who would be happy to um, assist you with interpreting those results. Now, additionally, when it comes to planting, um, blackberries are oftentimes planted in a hedgerow or in a row fashion. And you can space them two, three, um, four feet apart. You know, the exact spacing kind of depends on what your space is and also the variety that you've chosen to plant. Um, and if you have more than one row, just make sure you give yourself enough space to get a, you know, a lawnmower in between those rolls to, uh, rows, get in there to be able to pick and manage those, those uh, shrubs. You don't want to have them spaced so tightly together that you can't get in there and work and manage that space. Um, so if the soil uh, is just completely unsuitable and it's going to be too difficult to plant those blackberries directly in the soil, you can do a raised bed type situation like you see here. Um, I'd, I'd ideally like those beds to be a minimum of, of six uh, to 12 inches high and about two and a half to three feet wide. Now, uh, plants come in two different forms. Uh, you can do a container plant, and then you can also do a bare root plant, which is what you see pictured on the right. Um, 
as far as when you can plant, you can plant in the fall, winter, or spring. I like to um, advise against summer plantings just because uh, down here in the deep south it gets so, so hot and these plants would really need to be babied during the, the height of summer for those roots to establish and to minimize plant stress. And so it's not that it's impossible and you can't plant in summer, but those plantings do tend to suffer um, from some heat stress. And so if you can coordinate that planting for a fall, winter, or spring, I, I think that those plants get off to a better start. Um, as for how to plant, when it comes to containers, I'm sure you've heard this before, plant at the same depth that the plants were growing in the container and water thoroughly after transplanting. And again, this is a very small plant, so you'll wanna make sure it continues to get one to two inches of water um, a week. And so if we're having normal rainfall events, that's great, but if it hasn't rained in two weeks, you do need to get out there and make sure those plants are, are receiving the water they need for root development. As for the bare root plant on the right, um, Make sure you dig a hole uh, wide enough for the roots to spread out. You'll wanna completely cover the um, roots with soil and water in and just use those same um, watering principles once you have it planted. We don't want these plants undergoing drought stress early in their um, planting. So um, changing gears a little bit here and discussing the blackberry life cycle because it is fairly unique and it can be confusing to folks. So this is an illustration of a blackberry plant with different stages of growth and development. So what's really neat about the blackberry is it's a biennial perennial plant. And what that means is that perennial, so the plant will come back year after year, the crown will continue to send up new growth. But the new growth that is sent up has a two year life cycle to it. And so you can see here in this picture um, with the little um, red dots there on the cane, that is a second year cane that can bear fruit. So what'll happen is this plant will shoot up vegetative growth, um, what we call uh, primocanes or first year canes. And then that cane will um, remain above ground all year long it'll go through a winter and the next year it will become a, what we call a floricane, which is capable of flowering and producing fruit, which is what you see here on the right of this illustration. So um, after the plant fruits, that cane will die and you can see how the above ground portion of this plant um, perpetuates over time, rotating from primocane to floricane. And that's how we get fruit production from these plants. So we want to manage that above ground growth um, to our benefit. Additionally, the uh, blackberry plant will occasionally shoot up suckers that you can see here on the right. Um, and then also daughter plants, which are generally created when a primocane um, will lean over and the tip will make contact with the soil. And you can see where that tip um, created adventitious roots and um, created a new little plant next to it. So there, those are the two vegetative ways that the blackberry can um, propagate itself. And it can be advantageous or it can be um, something that you'll have to actively manage if those daughter plants and suckers, you know, get out of the production zone where you want that plant growing. So as I mentioned, after uh, fruiting, the floricane will die and then you'll be left with the primocane, which is the lifeblood of your fruiting crop for next year. So um, that might have been a little confusing for folks. So um, diagrams are great, but I wanted you to be able to see the real thing. So again, um, a primocane will be the new vegetative cane that emerges in the current year. And then the floricane is the cane that grew the previous year and is now two years old. And oftentimes these two life stages coexist at the same time. So if you see here, um, this first image on the left, that's nice lush green primocane growth growing up a trellis. And then in the top right corner in the circle, I, you can see a primocane that has shot up as a sucker in the, um, a little bit outside that mulch band. And then behind it, you can see the flowers, and that's a, 
that's a fluorocaine. So um, you'll want to be able to identify the difference so you know where your fruit's coming from and where next fruit, next year's fruit is coming from. And then here on the right, um, a fluorocaine. Another little nifty way to tell the difference between the two before there's flowers and fruits on fluorocanes. Generally, a primocane will have very bright green, um, tender new growth in five leaflets. And then that fluorocane tends to have darker, thicker foliage, and they tend to have three leaflets. So that's just another way for you to be able to tell the difference between these two life stages. Now, if that hasn't confused you enough, um, there are some other divisions when it comes to types of blackberries. So not only does the blackberry have two different above ground life stages, but it also has, um, can be categorized as having a trailing, a semi-trailing, or an erect um, growth habit. Um, additionally, they, they can or may not have thorns on them. And um, thanks to the breeding program out of Arkansas State University with Do Dr. John Clark, um, we now have primocane fruiting varieties, whereas before only fluorocane types were able to bear fruit. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but I also just wanted to mention that uh, down here in Georgia and mostly in the Southeast, we tend to grow erect type um, plants, which can stand on their own. Although I have come to find that um, most of these uh, blackberries, if you have them in a backyard setting, it's gonna benefit from having some type of trellis for support. And here's just kind of a, an, an image here of what that erect, semi-erect and trailing um, growth type will look like. Now let's talk about the first year. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming most of y'all are considering starting blackberries. And so for first year, um, what will happen is the plants will establish root systems and a moderate number of canes. And, and this will also kind of come down to when did you plant? Did you do a fall planting and we're about to go through our first summer or did you do a spring or did you plant in summer? So that will impact the level of growth you see that first year. But generally that first year growth is going to be trailing. It might even kind of look like a dewberry. Um, and while these primocanes are still really green and flexible, you're gonna wanna encourage those to grow up the trellis as opposed to just laying and growing along the ground, which is what it's gonna want to do without a little bit of guidance. Um, so what you'll do is just as that cane starts to grow, you'll gently um, redirect it to grow um, along the trellis wire. So what to expect the second year? So um, the growth will be more erect the next year. That root system is going to be more established and it's going to send up some new canes. So we're going to want to allow that new promocane growth to occur in the springtime. Again, directing it to grow up the trellis. Um, once the new shoots reach eight inches, maybe a foot long above the wire, you're going to want to tip those. And um, this principle is done in many different plants. And, and what removing that apical bud does is it encourages lateral growth, um, which, which is ultimately where the fruit's going to be born on these plants. So we definitely want to encourage lateral growth on these, on these shoots. Now, um, there are two different types of tipping. We have soft tipping, which is when you would pinch off the tender new growth at the tip of the cane. Um, and then we have hard tipping, which is generally done later in the season. You'll probably need to use hand shears or loppers um, to make sure you get a good clean cut um, on the more mature growth. And so this is what that looks like. Over here on the left, you can see the growth is a much smaller diameter than what it is on the right. And you can easily do this by hand. So if you only have a few plants in the backyard, you could theoretically do this while you're drinking your morning coffee. Um, so small diameter tipping is easily done by hand. And um, you'll also note that the resulting wound is significantly smaller, which will play into the susceptibility for, for disease infection later on. Um, looking over here to the right, you can see the larger diameter cut that was made with pruners. 
um, this wound is larger and the cane is more uh, susceptible to disease and infection after it's been injured, just like any plant would be. And we just want to make sure that we're using very sharp and clean tools. You know, a rough cut is going to make it more difficult for that plant to seal off the wound. So make sure you're using um, clean, sharp equipment when you're managing your plants. And again, I just wanted to show you here the result of the tipping. This was a hard tip done later in the summer. And you can see these lateral shoots that are coming out of the leaf axles here. And that's where that um, next year's fruit is going to be born. So again, we definitely wanna make sure we make time for tipping in the summer. So um, tipped canes tend to also grow a little more stout and they're more capable of supporting a heavy fruit crop. So some cultivars might only put out one or three large primocanes each year. That's okay, just make sure you take the time to tip those canes during summer when they reach about two or three feet so you can encourage that branching like you see here in this picture. All right, so um, again, I mentioned that we have that two-stage life cycle. So when do you remove the flora canes once they've started fruiting? Um, a good cue will be that you'll notice after the um, flush of harvest, which uh, tends to peak in July, you'll notice that those flora canes, they're no longer flowering, they're not setting new fruit, they probably will look a little bit ragged towards the end of the season, and they'll start dying. Um, there's nothing you can do to stop it. That's that plant life cycle um, taking effect. So after fruiting, um, as there's time, you will want to remove those dead flora canes from the planting and take the time to also um, go ahead and, and thin out any weak primocanes as, as time is allotted. And you'll want to make sure to um, destroy that plant material. Those old flora canes might have um, fungal disease spores from the previous season and you won't want that to carry over into next year. So you'll want to burn that or dispose of that plant material and certainly not leave it laying out in your, your fruit orchard. Now, um, in addition to summer pruning, there are some winter tasks associated with blackberries. So, and you'll want to do these tasks before new growth resumes in the springtime. So, um, really this is a great time to come out just like you would for any other fruit cop and evaluate where you stand. Chances are there might be some dead or injured canes and you'll want to take the time to remove those. Um, also, if you missed any other flora canes, go ahead and remove those. Um, additionally, these are very, very vigorous plants and they're going to want to send out more primocanes than you need for next year's harvest. It's kind of like muscadines. They're it, very, very um, precocious plants that will put on a ton of vegetative growth that um, might be excessive. So we'll want to take that time to select four to eight healthy, strong primocanes and remove the rest. And the exact number kind of depends on the size of your planting, what cultivar you're using, but I think that four to eight cane range um, should suit you well. And um, one way to know, well, which canes do I remove? How do I know? Um, some, some tricks, you, and you can see here in this picture, um, if a cane came out right directly in between these two plants, you would want to remove that one, or maybe there's one too far away from the crown. Um, so select those and, and just try to give these canes space. You'll also want to take this time to um, head back those laterals that we were training out when we pinched earlier in the season. Um, after you pinch, that lets those laterals grow. And again, that's where our fruit's going to be produced. But just like the muscadine, it's going to keep growing. And we don't need 36 inches of laterals. You can cut that back to a foot, maybe a foot and a half, and that's more than enough space for that fruit to be produced. So let's talk about fruiting types. So I mentioned earlier, um, blackberries are uh, divided by growth habit and um, also the way that it fruits. So normally, lots of our varieties are floricane fruiting types. And so what that means is the fruit 
is going to be born on the second year canes. Um, fruit is generally set in early summer and um, they're regularly pruned in the fall winter along with southern uh, uh, along with summer tipping. Um, and we these are tried and treed varieties. They, they're used um, down in the deep south and, and all over the, the southeast um, because they can tolerate the summer heat. Now we also have primocane fruiting varieties. And so that is um, fairly new and can be confusing to some folks. So what that means is that these varieties can fruit on one-year canes. And this fruit tends to be set in the early fall because again, if you think about the life cycle, a primocane will come up in spring, it'll need to grow all summer long, and then it'll be ready to set fruit in early fall. So you would want to do minimal fall pruning that you would absolutely have to tip in the spring because again, that fruit's going to be born on those lateral shoots. A little bit more about primocane fruiting types. Again, um, they fruit on the primocanes, but you can, if actively managed, produce fruit twice in a single season. So um, they can produce in the late summer or fall on the tips of these new canes. So if the canes are left for a second year, they will produce fruit in the second season and then die. So you can double crop these canes, prune the canes in the first winter, and you would, um, just as you would a floricane fruiting type. But if you choose to only grow a single crop in the late summer and early fall, prune, the cane, prune those canes to the ground each winter. So that, that can be confusing, and there's lots of information out there about these primocane fruiting varieties. But I do want to add a note because they're really nifty plants and a lot of people want to grow them. Um, but these types of blackberries um, will double crop best um, in our situation here in Georgia and North Georgia. And the reason for that is these plants are going to be setting their flowers in the height of the summer where it gets very, very hot. And so down in the Piedmont areas and the coastal plains, um, that's going to limit the number of flowers and your potential fruit development just because that's a very stressful time um, for a plant to be fruiting and you might not have as great of yields as if you were planting and, and growing a floricane fruiting type down here. So let's talk varieties just for a moment. I know we have folks joining us from several states so I don't want to get too specific because um, your situation might be different. But I do want to just mention some of the most popular um, varieties that have been around for a while. Um, most of these, if not all of them, are from the Arkansas State Breeding Program. Uh, if you look to the left here, we have our floricane fruiting type. So that's that normal variety um, that fruits on that second year growth. Um, so these are going to be thorny erect types. So these do have thorns. Chick um, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Kiowa, Shawnee. Um, those are all great varieties. They're prolific producers. Um, we also have some thornless floricane fruiting types, as you can see down here. All of those are excellent varieties as well. And then um, for those of you who I've piqued your curiosity regarding the primocane fruiting types, there are some thorny types. Those were the ones that were produced in the beginning of the primocane um, plant breeding program. Um, and then we have some uh, thornless erect types that have been released more recently, like Primark Freedom and Primark Traveler. So there are, there's a plethora of information out there about these different types of plants. And again, um, if you have any questions about cultivar selection for your area, I encourage you to reach out to your local extension contact for more information. Now, most blackberries are self-fruitful, if not all of them, to an extent. So in a backyard situation, um, one cultivar is going to be adequate for pollination and fruit production. So unlike the blueberry, where we, you would need two different types, like a Climax and a Premier, to cross-pollinate one, one another, you could just plant one Kiowa blackberry um, or several Kiowa blackberries and that, that wouldn't impact pollination um, for your fruit set. However, I do want to add that while blackberries can set fruit using their own pollen, um, research has shown time and time again 
that these plants benefit from insect pollinators helping transmit that pollen. So um, honeybees and our native bee species are very, very beneficial in the pollinating process. So do not um, think that that isn't the case. Now, um, timing for fruit. Blackberries ripen through late May and early July. Um, down here in Georgia, I, I recall eating um, blackberries during the 4th of July, so that they're in full swing that month. Now, what type of production can you expect to get from your plant? Now, uh, if you can um, visualize that slide I put out in front of, of the presentation that talked about weather and insect and disease and all of those other factors that might influence production. So that can vary from year to year. So I have a range here, depending on your level of management and your luck with the weather, a single plant can produce anywhere from a half to two and a half gallons of fruit. So these, these things can give you a lot of fruit and if they're well managed, you can have plenty to share with neighbors, family, and to freeze for the, for the winter months. Now, um, another thing to know about blackberries, and you can see I have all of the different stages of ripeness in this picture. Um, just like the strawberry, when you go to the grocery and those strawberries look fantastic in that clamshell, and then you open it and turn it over and um, half the strawberry is still green. Blackberries are the same way. Un unlike a tomato, they're not going to continue to ripen after you pick them. So you're going to want to harvest these blackberries at full maturity. And there's two stages where you can do that. We call it the shiny black stage and the dull black stage. So the shiny black, um, a creative name, I know it is, you can actually see that, um, that's that ripe berry on the left side of this picture here. Um, the best way I can describe it to you is it's, it's shiny and the droplets are a little more firm. So that is a perfectly um, fine ripeness stage to eat these berries, but it, it will have a higher acidity level. It'll be a little more sour. Um, and then we have the dull black stage, another creative name, and it's exactly as it says. Um, that, that fruit's been allowed to hang on that plant a little bit longer. The droplets are more full of juice, there's more sugar in there, and it's going to be a sweeter berry, but it's also not going to last as long because it's more advanced in that ripening process. So those are the two stages of fruit development where I recommend fresh eating. Um, and again, once you're in full production, you're gonna need to be picking these berries depending on how many plants you have every day to every other day for peak quality. Um, once these plants are um, allowed to hang fruit and the fruit starts to rot, you'll get vinegar flies and all sorts of other pests wanting to come in and, and eat that fruit. So again, uh, what limits production? There are quite a few things that can impact your success, but I do want to take a moment to discuss the more common pests and diseases that you will more than likely see at some point in a backyard production environment. Now, we won't have time to discuss all of them, so I know that I'm not covering every single pest and disease, but again, this is your lunch break and I don't want to hold you hostage all day, but here are some things that you might see um, in your backyard. So sun scald or sunburn of fruit is extremely common. Um, and it's most oftentimes seen um, during the height of summer once temperatures exceed um, and remain at 90 degrees or higher. So you can see in the, the image, um, the berry to the left here, where that fruit has been exposed to direct sunlight for an extended amount of time. And it's essentially boiled that plant and damaged its cells. So, um, you can see the change in color there and the shriveled up droplets. So that, that berry is um, not going to be palatable. And, and it's because of that direct sunlight. So um, management kind of comes into play here. We wanna keep these um, plants well irrigated. And we also wanna have a healthy canopy so that fruit is shaded by the foliage and not, and hopefully not too many are being exposed to direct sunlight. So again, the symptoms can include droplets that look um, blanched or, or cooked. And um, generally, you know, you'll know it's sun scald 
um, if the damage is only on one side of the fruit, that side that was making contact um, with the sunlight. White droplet disorder is also a biggie. I get calls about that every year. Um, and this is also something that'll occur during ripening. And it's associated with a drop in humidity and an increase in temperature. And so what that do does is, is it removes the amount of moisture in the air. And so that moisture is normally reflecting a level of the solar radiation from hitting those berries. So without that humidity, um, that radiation is making direct contact with those um, individual uh, droplets and, and it can bleach them out and turn them white and later on they'll um, they'll turn a little more brown in color. Now I realize this doesn't look very tasty but it's the berries are fine to eat and they really shouldn't taste any different. Um, and my recommendation to you, and, and there's really no way to get around it, there's always going to be some level of white droplet. Um, but just use those in your pies or jams and jellies, and no one will be uh, any wiser that you had white droplet on your berries. Now on the other um, side of that token, we have um, what we call red droplet disorder or red cell regression. And so this is an interesting phenomenon that is also associated with temperature, but in this case, it's a rapid change in temperature, um, going from hot to cold, most likely. So with how to deal with this is honestly prevention's the key. I recommend, as with any um, fruit or small fruit, uh, you'll want to harvest early in the morning hours while those berries are still cool. Um, berries will accumulate something that we call field heat throughout the day. So as the day goes on and it gets warmer, um, these berries will get quite warm on the plant. But then once the sun goes down, they cool in the evening naturally, slowly over time. So what can happen, um, you can be out in the middle of the day, one or two o'clock, picking your berries. They'll be very warm and full of field heat. And then you'll go put them in the freezer or the uh, refrigerator to cool them down. And that rapid change in temperature will actually cause um, that uh, dark color to regress to more of a red coloration. And so um, again, the ways to manage this is really just preventing it. So again, harvest early in the morning or um, do a stepwise cooling. Whereas um, if you were picking out late in the day, put those berries on the counter, let them come to room temperature um, and then put them in the refrigerator. And that should hopefully um, prevent extreme um, red cell regression but just like white droplet, it's not making the berry inedible, it's just not as pretty anymore. So again, I recommend using these in jams and jellies or your baked goods, and it's, it's certainly not a health concern, it's just um, an aesthetic concern. Another thing you might see in the home landscape is um, double berry. So um, this is a physiological disorder um, that generally will occur during high temperatures um, right before or at flowering. Um, we see this a lot down in South Georgia. It's not that big of a deal, um, but again, it's something that you might see more with primocane fruiting varieties just because of their timing of flowering will be directly correlated with the site of the height of the uh, summer heat here and uh, that can cause that double berry. Um, poor pollination can certainly be an issue um, and result in small fruit like you see here in this picture. Um, if we don't get adequate fertilization, we're not going to have um, those multiple droplets forming. So um, again, this is going to be directly tied to um, pollination. So we want those um, insect um, pollinators providing their ecosystem services and visiting our flowers and sometimes the weather is just not on our side. Um, pollination tends to be somewhat reduced during sustained cool and cloudy weather. So if you see this, um, just know that all oh, this flower wasn't visited enough or it didn't receive adequate pollination. Um, and it certainly shouldn't be your whole plant showing this, but it's not uncommon to see um, these uh, poor droplet formation on some of these plants. 
I'm not going to get into viruses too much, but I do want to make note of it because it is something that we might see here um, in the southeast, and it can certainly lead to um, overall reduction in fruit development and poor droplet formation. So this image here, without getting too into the weeds, is just a depiction of the different um, ways that a virus might express itself in foliage. So you can see we have the oak leaf formation here on the top left, and then we have the ring spots, and um, we also, as you can see in um, the far right bottom picture, we have that um, vein yellowing. That's very indicative of the um, yellow vein associated virus. So um, blackberries can get these viruses. Um, some of them are able to withstand and suppress them. It's certainly not going to be an impact to um, personal health. If a, if a plant gets a plant virus, it can't be transmitted to us in any way, but it does Im impact growth and development of that plant. So if, you're, if you get a confirmation that your plant does have a yellow vein virus, for example, go ahead and remove that plant so it's not transmitted to your other plants. And just really quickly here, um, just a few notes about um, disease. So uh, if this is a new picture for some of you, I do wanna talk about it. It's our disease triangle. And so what this means is that for a, a plant to contract a disease, it needs to first of all have um, an, a conducive environment for the disease to take place. And then the pathogen like the fungi um, needs to be present in the environment. So we need the host, the pathogen and the correct environmental conditions for a disease to occur. Um, and so just a few notes here on the successful management of diseases because there's no one silver bullet. Um, if only there were, it would make growing fruit much more um, easy to do and a lot more people would do it. Uh, so just some things to consider when it comes to successful disease management in a backyard setting. First of all, we need to know what diseases can occur on your crops and how they impact yield. Um, for example, the white droplet is a physiological disorder. It's not a disease. So we need to know what the actual diseases are so you can be on the lookout for them, which is my next point. Um, you need to be out there looking at your plants. Are there any indicators of plant stress like leaf spots or leaf drops? Um, are there any structures growing on there like spores indicating that there might be something amiss? Um, and then lastly, uh, know how these diseases spread and what conditions favor the development. If we have a really chronically wet spring, you're gonna wanna be on the lookout for rust. So um, these are just some things for you to feel a little more comfortable with knowing what to look for and when. So there's two diseases in um, the southeast that uh, cause a rust, and you need to be aware of the differences between these two. So orange rust is the disease that is systemic, and once observed, you need to remove this plant to prevent further spread. I highly encourage you to get your extension agent to confirm if you have uh, orange rust before you destroy your plant. But um, some of the things to look out for are these bright orange blister-like lesions that are going to distort the margin of the leaf like you see in this top picture here. Um, and you can see in the bottom, it kind of causes that leaf to cup. And again, note that those blisters are occurring on the margin of the leaf. We also have blackberry cane and leaf rust. Um, which generally is going to lead to damage the foliage and canes if left unmanaged. It's very common and generally first observed on the underside of the fluorocane leaves early in the season, but it can be seen on pronocanes later in the summer. Um, so again, um, be on the lookout for these um, yellow spores and that lets you know that there is something amiss here and you need to um, look into remediation. We also have blackberry rosette, and this is pretty common if you live in a more rural area where wild blackberries and dewberries are just growing along the roadsides. Um, what this is is a fungal infection that will um, cause flowers uh, to have distorted petals and the large sepals, 
kind of giving it that double blossom type look. Um, and it also just generally causes the plant to have abnormal leafy protrusions, strange growth. Like you would notice this if you were out in your backyard um, and you saw this type of growth on your plant. Um, how it happens is uh, buds of new canes will be infected from spores. Again, this is a fungal uh, infection. And so these spores are just floating around, um, but these buds will be infected and um, the infected canes will then develop symptoms the following year. So um, you can get your infected infection from spores from wild blackberries or, or it's, it's really difficult to trace the source, but these are the symptoms to look for. And if you get it, then you need to remove those plants because it's not curative. Something else to look for is anthracnose. So you see these uh, silver, silvery lesions here on the right, and then the strange round crumbly shrunken droplets on the left. This is a, a common fungal disorder that you'll see as well, and it likes extended periods of wet weather or heavy use of overhead irrigation might also lead to this disease. We also have stink bugs. Uh, I tell you, stink, stink bugs, they'll just, uh, They'll eat anything. They're generalist feeders, but they love to uh, feed on the blackberry fruit and cause these uh, shrunken droplets that you see here. So you might think that this is white droplet, but um, you can see that the damage looks slightly different. They'll feed on all stages of the fruit development and um, it's sometimes they'll inject their um, stink into the fruit and you'll have a very um, off-putting berry taste there. So stink bugs and true bugs, anything with that piercing sucking mouth part uh, can, can cause this type of damage. And then lastly, um, I just wanted to mention spotted wing drosophila. This is a um, invasive insect that came out of Asia um, in the early 2000s and since then has spread to all corners of the United States. And what makes this uh, fly different and an issue for us is that the female has this saw-shaped ovipositor that you can see magnified here on the right. And what she will do is she will seek out um, ripening fruit as opposed to our native uh, flies that um, tend to seek out that um, overly ripe fruit to feed on and she will use her ovipositor to saw a little hole and lay her eggs and what the result ends up being is um, fly larvae growing and, and eating your, your fruit and so you can imagine um, how um, unappetizing that is. You can see here in this picture on the the bottom right of that fly larvae um, growing in your fruit. And so if you're anything like my mother, um, the thought of having fly larva in your fruit is just unacceptable and horrifying and she wouldn't stand for it. So one way you can monitor for this pest um, is to set up a little trap. You can use apple cider vinegar or a fermented sugar trap to catch uh, and monitor for the adults. So you would know when they were present in your landscape. So you might need to spray those plants um, to prevent that insect from laying her eggs on your fruit. Another way to prevent it is just to um, harvest that fruit regularly and um, eat it quickly and uh, freeze any extra. And that would, if there was a very, very tiny insect in there, it, that would kill the insect. But here is a short recipe here for um, the uh, trap, but this is also widely accessible um, and your, your local county extension contact could certainly share this information with you. Um, and then lastly, I just want to mention um, some concepts that are important to managing plant diseases. Of course, you know, we want to use um, clean plant stock. We want to keep up with our plants and do proper pruning practices. Um, we want these plants to be healthy, um, so do that soil test and make sure your plants have all of the nutrients they need. Water them regularly. A healthy plant is a resilient plant. Um, and then also, I highly encourage you to get out in your yard and scout your plants. You know, 
look for those symptoms that something might be amiss and don't wait until it becomes a disaster. Go ahead and take that picture, email your county extension agent and find out what's wrong so you can treat it before it gets out of hand. And then lastly, if you are spraying fruit, I just want to mention that the label is the law. If the fruit crop isn't listed on that product, then you don't need to be spraying it. And if you have any questions about what to use and when and for what, again, I highly encourage you to reach out to your local extension contact. Um, of course, when treating uh, your plants with any type of spray, we want to make sure that we're protecting our pollinators and being mindful of our beneficial organisms that help uh, us fight the bad guys. So pollinators are generally most active during the height of the day, day hours. So we want to spray very, very early in the morning or ideally in the evening after the pollinators are no longer working flowers or out and about. And that will help mitigate any unintended, unintended exposure to non-target species. Um, and then lastly, I know we're um, kind of short on time here. We got a late start, but um, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, you have survived your first session of the Backyard Fruit webinar series. I hope that you found this Blackberry session informative and you've been given some information you need to decide if this is the journey you want to take or if it's not for you. Um, I know we're, we're at one o'clock, so we might lose some folks, but I do want to thank you uh, for signing on. We'll take a few questions here, but I do want to also state that um, we want to know if this was helpful to you. So I will be emailing you this afternoon a very short six, six um, question survey. It's multiple choice. You can do it on your cell phone in about 30 seconds. It'll be very helpful to me in knowing um, if this was helpful to you. And I, I thank you for attending. So. Um, Let's turn it over to our panelists. Do we have any um, questions that need to be addressed now? Hey, Ashley, can you talk about um, the techniques for growing boysenberries and are they similar? Um, I actually can't talk about the, the techniques of growing boysenberries right now. I'm afraid you got me. Um, that is something that I would need to look up and um, first of all know where you are um, in the country. And uh, yeah, I think that would be best if I just followed up with this individual um, after the session, since that's not a Blackberry question, and I'll get that information for them. Okay, another question is, what can you put on Blackberry bushes to get rid of stink bugs? Right, so and that's and that's tough because um, stink bugs are pretty mobile uh, insects, and so you'll you'll have to use um, probably a synthetic pyrethroid is going to be the most effective, which is um, unfortunate too because that's also um, a general uh, insecticide that can also um, harm our beneficial insects. So um, a synthetic pyrethroid, you know, that's a contact insecticide. So you'll want to um, spray that plant according to the label. Um, there are many, many products out on the market that have that, in, that active ingredient in there. Um, so read the label, um, make sure blackberries are listed and mix it according to what the recommendations are for stink bugs. There are other chemicals that um, are, would, would do this, the same thing. Okay, there's another question. Is there an average life expectancy for a blackberry plant? Great question. So um, there are some folks who have had their plantings for over 10 years and there's no sign of those, um, the health of those uh, plants dwindling. I think really what it comes down to is um, how actively you're managing those plants. If the plants um, came in with uh, any type of um, virus infection or um, got off to a bad start. Um, but theoretically, yes, these plants can be very long lived. I actually have a, a friend who grows these commercially in Alabama and he's had some vines for, for over 20 or uh, some uh, 
plants for over 20 years and has grown them very successfully. So you kind of, you get out of it what you put into it. Okay, and do these management rules also apply to raspberries? Right, so um, yes, so raspberries have a very similar um, growth habit and uh, are managed similarly. I didn't discuss raspberries today just for time's sake really, and also depending on where you're located in the country, it can be um, very challenging. Our most um, limiting uh, reason for not growing raspberries as widely as we would like to in the deep south is because of heat. Um, they're a more delicate plant and they don't like the extreme heat we get in the summers and so that really impacts um, the level of fruit production you'll get. But UGA Extension does have a, pr a publication that discusses blackberry and raspberry production so you could get some more information from that publication for sure. Okay, there were also several questions about fertilizing blackberries and um, when to do it and how, um, how much. Right, so that's also <laughs> uh, my favorite horticultural answer is it depends. So it's going to depend on how old that plant is um, and what the soil test says. So um, you'll, you can do a spring um, application and then you can do a application right after fruiting. Um, but I would prefer to refer you to the um, extension publications on the exact amounts and the timing. Because again, we have people viewing from all over the Southeast right now. So I don't want to say anything too specific and that not be the correct recommendation based on your specific area where you're, you are. But um, as far as like really specific fertility questions go, we can certainly work with you um, depending on where you are and on that soil test. Any, any other questions? Are there any disadvantages to the thornless varieties? Um, not that I can think of, and I, um, I'm trying to think of what the, like maybe a reduction in fruit yield, something like that. Um, I can't think of any for a backyard setting uh, that would be like a negative. Okay, another question that keeps coming through is can blackberries and raspberries be planted together if you have space limitations? I think that would come down to, um, that's an interesting question. So intercropping those two plants. Um, or within close proximity to one another. Um, I think you could, sure. I, I think that the main issue you're going to face with raspberries, and again, this depends on where you are in the country, is, is the summer heat. I've known some people to try to grow raspberries with a like a shade cloth draped over them to help um, alleviate some of that heat stress that they get. Um, but I, I don't see why you couldn't grow them in close proximity. Uh, there's no reason why you couldn't give it a go and, and see how they do, but um, it would be somewhat problematic, I would think, if you uh, if the plants didn't do well and you wanted to remove them and they were really intermingled with the canes of the blackberries, that might be challenging. And then also just pruning and managing those, it might get a little confusing if they're mixed together. But I don't, I don't see any reason why you can't. It just might get a little confusing um, if they're very, very closely planted. Okay, and how sh tall should the trellises be? So that kind of is up, that's kind of up to the homeowner because we're not talking commercial production here. Um, I wouldn't personally have that um, top wire or any higher than what you would feel comfortable with pruning and managing. 
Um, so I would say no higher than four and a half or five feet. Um, and especially if we're wanting to maintain these plants um, shorter than that, uh, having that trellis wire at um, two feet and four feet to support the plant should be adequate. Okay. And based on Georgia's spring weather the last few years, would you recommend erring on the side of going with the cooler grow zone if you're pretty close to the line? Going with the cooler grow zone. Um, as a side of caution. Are we referring to like uh, varieties based on chilling hour requirement or? I'm afraid I don't quite understand the question. And I'm not sure what the context is on that one specifically. Okay. And there is a question about, can you use tomato cages to, um, I guess bypass doing a trellis. Interesting. So um, that's in, in, and I love backyard gardening because there are so many interesting innovations that you wouldn't normally see in a commercial type situation. Um, so I don't want to say no, you can't. Um, it might be kind of annoying getting those canes out of that cage during pruning and, and also keeping up with what's the floricane and what's the primocane and just getting in there and doing the actual pruning. I think that uh, like a trellis with a horizontal wire would make it easier for management um, practices, but I, I wouldn't say no. Now with a lot of these erect types, if you manage them and keep them at a three, three foot level, they, they're pretty, resilient and can stand on their own if you get a true erect growing type. So it might be um, forgo the tomato cage and see how they are on their own. Um, but you're always welcome to give it a shot. I just worry about um, accessibility when it comes to pruning the crown of that plant over time. Okay, sorry, I heard back from the question that I asked you um, just before that one, and she said more along with the frost timing as far as going with or airing on the side of caution with the cooler grow zone, if you're pretty close to the line. Um, it's, the weather is just so variable. I don't feel like I can really give you a, a reliable answer, um, but I would definitely select varieties that aren't going to be, that aren't low chill, uh, so you wouldn't get early bud break. Um, generally, these plants have ranges for, for chilling hours and, and when they should be breaking bud, things like that. So, um, if you're concerned that your, your growing zone is, is on the cold, colder end, um, I would pick a variety that's a higher chill variety. So you would hopefully not have that early bud break, you know, um, that you would have in like a southern uh, warmer climate. Okay, and can you talk a little bit about when you're planting your blackberries and you're in your yard, what direction or side of the yard would be most beneficial for blackberries? There is um, a question about planting blackberries on the side of a fence. Um, and there was also another question about hillsides, which direction would be best suited for growing blackberries? So um, as far as planting along a fence goes, I don't see any reason why you can't do it. I've seen it in backyard settings before. Um, I think that use what you have and try to create a trellis that works for you in your backyard environment. You know, again, it's one of those things, you know, when you're not is for your own personal use, you can make concessions and, and build trellises that work for you with the materials that you have. So I don't see why that would be a problem. Um, what was the other question? If you're planting on a hillside, does it matter what direction you're planting on? Well, so um, it depends. So um, the southwestern side of a, of a slope is going to be warmer but it's also going to uh, 
possibly lead to um, winter injury because again, that side of the hill is going to be warmer. So if we're in the middle of winter and we have a nice warm, hot, sunny day like we tend to have in the south around Christmas, for example, um, that can kind of trick those plants into um, uh, getting out of dormancy somewhat. And then if we get a really um, cold dip in temperature the next night, um, that could lead to um, winter injury of those vines. Now that won't always be the case, but that is um, a, one of the uh, variables in planting on the southern side of a slope. Um, having said that, the northern side is going to be more shaded and colder, um, but if you're planted on that slope and there are no um, obstructions keeping that cold air from draining away from your plants, you might have a later bud break than you would if you had planted on the southern end of the slope where it's warmer and those plants are going to emerge from dormancy slightly sooner, um, but the chances of winter injury are going to be somewhat mitigated. I hope I answered your question. Hey, Ashley, maybe, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, since there's some questions about wild blackberries, um, can you maybe talk about the fact that they can kind of serve as a jumping off point for diseases, uh, particularly the viral diseases? Yeah, absolutely. And so that, that is a problem and it, and it kind of comes down to, again, where you are. If you're in a more rural area, chances are there's going to be more um, wild brambles around than if you were in a, you know, metro Atlanta, um, you know, environment. But then again, these are pretty resilient plants and I see them along the roadsides all the time. So um, it's safe to assume that the, the danger lurks. And so when it comes to double blossom uh, and um, yellow vein virus, uh, you know, the recommendations are essentially if you know of any wild brambles that you can remove, that's recommended because they're going to be reservoirs of, of um, potential viral complexes, double blossom, and, and other um, diseases that will um, impact your uh, backyard planting. But it also comes down to you can only control so much of, you know, whatever your environment has is what you have control over. So um, my best advice for you um, regarding managing these diseases are to keep your eyes open and pay attention to your plants throughout the growing season. So if it's something like anthracnose or um, uh, leaf rust, you can apply a fungicide um, and manage that disease before it becomes an issue. Or if you do end up with yellow vein virus, really the only alternative is to destroy that plant. Um, and you certainly wouldn't want to um, propagate, you know, another, you know, plant from that infected plant. And I, I hope I've answered the question it's just difficult when there are reservoir species around, and if you don't have access to them, then you're kind of just at the mercy of your environment. But if you do live in an area where you know you have wild brambles uh, on your property, you can uh, use glyphosate um, at the end of the summer and uh, destroy those, those wild plants, uh, and that should help. But we are um, 20 minutes um, after, uh, so we do need to end this webinar. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I love all of the questions and the interest, but unfortunately, we would be here all afternoon fielding questions uh, if we uh, tried to answer every single one. I, I do love the interest and the engagement. Um, you're welcome to email me with any questions, but again, I highly encourage you to reach out to your local extension contact um, for any um, specific questions you might have for your backyard setting, as those are the, the your local county agent will be the one to work with you directly um, throughout your production journey. And I do hope that most of you are registered for this Friday session on blueberries. Uh, Renee Holland will be presenting on that um, same time, same place uh, this Friday. And just like before, I will email you the webinar link um, 
Thursday evening and I'll send you a reminder Friday morning for attendance. So um, unless there's any other very pressing business, I'm going to have to end this uh, webinar um, here in just a moment.